And he goes, you, if you were calm, I knew that we were going to make it through this. And I'm like, okay, um, well, <laughs> what if one I, day, just, just to screw with them one day, you should have started pulling your hair out and throwing yeah, pictures against the wall. Setting, <laughs> setting my hair on fire. Hi, I'm Jim O'Shaughnessy and welcome to Infinite Loops. Sometimes we get caught up in what feel like infinite loops when trying to figure things out. Markets go up and down, research is presented and then refuted, and we find ourselves right back where we started. The goal of this podcast is to learn how we can reset our thinking on issues that hopefully leaves us with a better understanding as to why we think the way we think and how we might be able to change that to avoid going in infinite loops of thought. We hope to offer our listeners a fresh perspective on a variety of issues and look at them through a multifaceted lens, including history, philosophy, art, science, linguistics, and yes, also through quantitative analysis. And through these discussions, help you not only become a better investor, but also become a more nuanced thinker. With each episode, we hope to bring you along with us as we learn together. Thanks for joining us. Now, please enjoy this episode of Infinite Loops. Jim O'Shaughnessy is Chairman and Co-Chief Investment Officer of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management, where Jamie Catherwood is an associate. All opinions expressed by Jim, Jamie, and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinions of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Clients of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Well, hello, everyone. It's Jim O'Shaughnessy with another edition of Infinite Loops. I am very excited today to have as my guest a friend, Morgan Housel, who you might have heard of. I don't know. He's the author of The Psychology of Money, which is at 1 million, 1.1 million. What are we at now, Morgan? I think we're at about one and a half now. It's always, it's always a, a little bit... It's always a little bit difficult because the international sales, which is a big portion of the sales, there's a big delay on the data that we get from them. U.S. sales, we have like up to the day information. Sales in India and China, we get like once every six months. So the data is a little, but roughly one and a half in that, in that neighborhood. Yeah. So fucking cool. And it couldn't happen to a nicer guy. I'm delighted to hear that. You are also a partner at the Collaborative Fund. At what point are they just going to say, Morgan, like, we can't afford you anymore. Like, do you think that will happen? Or do, no, keep- no, that, that won't happen. Collaborative Fund is is such a gift to me. And there's there's I, I honestly can't see any situation in which why I would I would want to leave. They give me total free reign to write what I want when I want about whatever I want with no constraints. You'd be like, why would I why would I ever leave that and work with a group of people who I really like and admire? It's like that's the perfect setup. I've I, I learned this about myself. I don't know, 10 years ago. And I'm not proud of this. This is not bragging. This is a personality flaw. I'm not a good employee. I can do good work, but I'm a very bad employee. And um, it, it, it was, it's hard to find a place like Collaborative Fund that will just give me complete free reign to kind of paint my own canvas and do what I want to do. That's fantastic. And, you know, it's another thing we share. Um, I generally think of myself as unemployable uh, yes. other than by myself. And sometimes even I don't want to hire me because I'm such, you know, a pain in the ass for, for everyone involved. But that's, you know, that's a really cool situation to have. People don't, don't understand. The, the, the quirk that people don't understand about what I do at Collaborative Fund too is I never write about things we do at Collaborative Fund. I never say, here's the deals that we did. Here's why we're so much better than everything else. I could, I, I, I have those stories that I genuinely believe, but nobody wants to read that. That's, no. the, that's the truth. People don't want to read what is clearly marketing, um, but they will want to read and share with their friends and forward on to their coworkers an article about something that has to do with investing or history or psychology. It's like those, I, I just want to write things that people will want to share. And if I do that and gain the largest audience, cast the widest net, people will learn through osmosis about what collaborative fun is. And that is so much more effective and then force feeding them by saying, here's why we're so great. Here's why we're so great. And I think, I feel like a lot of asset managers that have finally woken up to, we need to have a blog. We need to have a podcast. 
they still do it wrong because what they write about is how good they are and why you should give them their money. And nobody wants to read that. I could not agree with you more. And luckily, Patrick and I are so simpatico on this. It's just like, you know what? Nobody gives a fuck about you. Really, they, they, if they do, they want to know how can you help them? How can you give them something that's interesting that might not be in their toolkit? You've got to be useful. And the way to be useful, in my opinion, is to be an honest broker about, hey, have you thought about this, this, or this? And so like whenever, for example, when I, I'm commenting on anything uh, about OSAM, I always lead in with talking my book yeah. because I want people to know with that line, I'm, I'm going to throw a little marketing at you here. <laughs> but, totally, totally. I mean, here, there, there's the old phrase about mutual funds that people do not buy mutual funds. They are sold, sold mutual funds. And it's the same with marketing. There's a reason that advertisements, commercials are forced upon you. No one goes out and seeks it. No one wakes up and says, I want to go watch some commercials on TV. Like, like where's the YouTube channel that just gives me advertising? Nobody wants that. They force them upon you. So if you can take the same benefit of, of marketing yourself, but do it in a way that people actually seek out, that people wake up and say, I want to read Morgan's blog. I want to listen to Jim's podcast. I want to listen to Patrick's podcast. That's when it's just like exponential opportunity. Totally. And it, it, the, the, the hard part about that, um, for some people at least, is transparency. You've got to be an honest broker. Um, like if, 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 you, if there's something that you're benefiting from, you better acknowledge that you're benefiting from that thing because yeah. like you you the reason i think you have such wide sway and people read you so widely and you've sold a million and a half copies of your books you're an honest broker and like it's like there is no you you are very clear that you don't have an agenda you don't have an agenda for collaborative fund you don't have an agenda for you know there's no morgan housel fund you're not, you're not advising on Morgan, Morgan's 10 great ideas. And that there's so much of that that goes on in our industry. And I just think that the world has changed so much that those old models, they don't work anymore. Totally. I mean, here's, here's what's interesting to tie us back to the book. When my book came out, uh, Jason Zweig, who is a great friend of mine, uh, one of the best finance writers of, of all time, the Wall Street Journal, I asked him, I said, Jason, you've written uh, you know, several books. This is my first real book. Um, how should, how should I market this? So like, tell me like what I should do. And he said, let me give you some advice. If the book is good, you don't need to market it. And if the book is bad, no amount of marketing will help. And how, so he was like, so here's, here's my advice. Don't worry about it. It's already done. It's already set in stone. <laughs> like whatever's going to happen, it's already done. And I think that was like 20% tongue in cheek. I think there is some honesty, some that, 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 that is true, but like, it's, it's only like mostly true. It's not hundred percent true, but I loved it. And I feel like it's true for companies as well. Some of the greatest companies in the world actually don't advertise that much. Apple, for example, like there are, like there are a couple Apple billboards, but not that much. Apple sells because it's a good product. And yep. it's, and, and, and the flip side of that is there are some really shitty products that stuff marketing down your throat and they sell a little bit, but not, not like the great products. Like the best marketing hack is make a product that people want and need. <laughs> that's, Very that's, simple. that's the, that's the marketing hack. And Very I feel like this simple. is true for, for a lot of, um, for, for, for all forms of content. Like it, if it's good, I would say like for new bloggers, when they're like, how can I get noticed? How can I get big? I would say like, blogging and the content space is a pure meritocracy. If you're good, you'll get noticed. It might take a couple of years, but you will get noticed. And if you're not good, you're never going to get noticed. That, that's it. That's the hack. <laughs> that's the yeah. marketing hack of how to break your, break your way in. Yeah. Um, I, I remember uh, Nick Majuli, who um, you know, is fairly new at what he does. I think he started his blog, I want to say maybe 2017 in that neighborhood, if I'm getting it wrong by a couple of years, but it's around that time. Yeah. I, when he started blogging and he was at the time a, a nobody, I knew, I remember reading his blog and being like, this, this guy's going to be big because writing is a meritocracy and he's one of the best and he will get noticed as he has. Yeah. So uh, Nick worked for us at OSAM for a little while before moving over to Ritholtz and it was as a convenience. We knew he was going over there and they were one of our bigger clients and he wanted to move east earlier than his employment started there. Uh, so got to know him really well. Love Nick. Uh, I have his his book that's coming out and and yep. endorsed it and 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 it's really good. I did tease him about uh, that he was going to have an inside metric that no one else was going to have, and he's like, "What's that?" We were at lunch in New York, and I said, "Dude, 
the title of your book is Just Keep Buying. Okay. I think that's it. Am I wrong? Yeah. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just keep buying. Just keep buying. Um, and I said, when the next bear market comes, you need to have a histogram of the number of people who tell you that you're an idiot, a moron, look at what's going on here. And I said, when that peaks, you are going to be within a, a week of the bottom. And he's like, <laughs> that's true. That's holy true. Yeah. shit. And I went, yeah. You got to share it's, it with right. me, though. <laughs> and here, here's what here's what's interesting. If you just judge the book by its cover, you might think that Nick's Nick's book, like the message is the stock market always goes up, and it's actually the opposite. It's just keep buying even when there is hell and fury and depressions and bear markets, which there will be and are. Um, then that's when you have to just keep buying. So people will. I, I know, and you're right. This is. I think this is your point. Like people are going to use it as an indicator of like, oh, someone wrote a book called Just keep buying as a stock market was at some crazy high, like this is the next Dow 36. I was like, no, no, it's actually the opposite. His exactly. point is that the market is going to crash and you need to just keep buying. Exactly. And, you know, it's like I experienced this when I was doing Netfolio, which was kind of my early version of what we now call Canvas. Um, uh, mine was a little early. It was in 2000 and we really didn't have the tech, but our whole thing was personal funds, not mutual funds, different world. Then most people didn't index. Most people used active funds. Uh, and so our, our take was you should be able to customize your portfolio down to your specific likes and dislikes. Uh, and so we came up with the idea of calling the, what was generated a personal fund. And we felt that if we were going to have this huge marketing blitz on personal funds that was essentially taking aim at mutual funds, I still have the ads. I should send them to you. They're hilarious. We hired a great ad agency. So anyway, we sold. We had a mutual fund family and we sold it in the United States because we thought the conflict between our new focus on personal funds and mutual funds was, um, was uh, going to have a conflict. Well, even our mutual friend, Jason Zweig, took me on and you know, took me to the uh, woodshed uh, because everyone viewed it as me abandoning the strategies. Of course, yeah. I wasn't doing that. I was, I was doing the other. I, in fact, I, we were retaining every strategy even more so, but perception is reality. Yep. And, but I think that that's a potential edge, which we're going to talk about later. Um, but so I know what it feels like. And, yeah. and like, so literally everybody, and, but I was getting bashed in the mainstream press. Like you, you haven't really experienced it. You know, there's one thing if uh, angry Al one, two, three on Twitter, who has 14 followers, is yelling at you. It's quite yeah. another thing when the Wall Street Journal is writing yeah. a story talking about how you suck. <laughs> feels feels different. Um, Jason, I, he might not want me telling the story, but I'm going to tell it anyways. Before my book came out, and he, no, no, I want, I want, I want to make sure I get this right. He said it was somebody else asked him to review his book, their book. Yeah. And Jason said, I will do it, but I'm, I'm going to warn you, I'm, I'm going to be honest, and you might not want me to review it. So, so something along those lines, I'm, I'm paraphrasing that story, but that's, that's what makes Jason great. Um, is just his ability to call it like, like he sees it, but you, but you're right. That like perception becomes reality for a lot of these stories. And yeah. um, it's, it's hard to write, to write publicly as I do and you do and to mean one thing and for it to be perceived as another. I'll tell you one story from my book that I, I regret the biggest regret that I have from the book. And this is in the introduction of the book, which is, you know, most, most people don't finish books, but hopefully you, you read the, end, the, the, the first three pages. I, I tell the story, I tell the story of about, of, about a guy named Ronald Reed, who was a janitor and a gas station attendant. And then he died and he had $7 million and he left it to various charities. And a lot of people, the, the feedback was, Morgan, you portray this guy as a hero. And this was a guy who was a gas station attendant and died the richest man in the cemetery. That's my idol that I'm supposed to look up to. And, 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 and my, my thing is like, no, you're actually, you're right. Like I do actually, I actually don't idolize what he did. My point was that it's possible to become rich, even if you are a gas station attendant, but I did not want to, uh, you know, sanctify this guy's lifestyle. That was, that wasn't the point, but I, I understand why it was so easy to do that. And here's, what's interesting 
for a lot of the blogs that I write, more than half, sometimes days, weeks, even months after I write them, I go back and update it because I realize like, hey, this point that I was making came across differently than I thought it would. So let's just go in and update it and change it. A book you can't update. Once it goes right. to the printer, you're, you're done. It goes, it's out, it's out there. There's, it's like speaking, like say you're done. And so that's what's hard about it being out there and, and being unable to change it. So, so that's a perfect lead in to what I wanted to do today. Uh, you and I chatted via text and, and I thought, you know, I loved seeing you on all the, you know, the most important uh, podcasts like Tim Ferriss, getting interviewed uh, in the most important publications. And, and I thought to myself, I know Morgan and I know he's an incredibly thoughtful guy and I bet he has learned a ton from just the feedback that you've received from the book. And so what I wanted to do today was look at that. Um, because in my experience, uh, What Works on Wall Street was a bestseller, not like your book, obviously. Uh, but um, I had a ton of feedback on it and a lot of it was really good. Uh, in other words, I was wrong. And the feedback that uh, I got made me think, Oh, I was probably wrong about that. I should do some more research. A classic example was in the first version of the book, I said that price to sales was the king of value ratios. Rookie, rookie mistake, right? So like I, I forgot, oh, it depends on what end date we're looking at, right? So if, if we went forward five years, it might be PE or price to cash flow, but yeah. it gave me really, really good ideas. So I guess my first question for you is, you know, you, you have all of the various uh, uh, items like no one's crazy, you really want freedom, you, you, don't, you don't want a never enough attitude. Are there any of your, your main points in the book that when you interact it with people, you're like, no, that isn't what I meant at all. That's not it at all. Uh, yeah, good, good question. Um... I don't know if like other than the the Ronald Reed thing that I just shared of like it it came off and I understand this is not like a misreading it it totally reads like I was saying he's the he like Ronald Reed is the hero, and that wasn't what what I meant. Um, I mean there are parts of the book where I'm it's like I, I do think that living a, a a low key life where you value independence over material things is is the 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 fastest way to happiness. But Ronald Reed was such an extreme oddball on that side that it's, I, I don't I don't want to push that um, towards it. I mean, one thing that a, a common piece of feedback that I got that I understand, but it still just kind of doesn't disappoint me because I understand why it happens. I just think it's interesting is I've always been open about how I invest. I'm a passive index investor. I've got almost my whole net worth in Vanguard where I'm going to leave it for the next 50 years. And there are a lot of feedback on the book. Was, and so I, I wrote that in like one of the last chapters, it's called Confessions. And it's, here's what my wife and I do with our money. I want to lay it out on the table. This is what we do personally. Yeah. And a lot of people said, I love the book until I got to the last chapter. And I found out that you just invest in index funds and it ruined everything up into that. Because, because they, they, they said, how do I take you seriously now if you're just an index fund investor? And that, like, and again, I understand that why people would associate that with someone who doesn't know what they're doing. And what they wanted is in the last chapter, like here's my ridiculous day trading strategy that's made me a zillionaire. That's what they wanted because that's the knee-jerk reaction. I just think it's, it's fascinating if, because the, the, the numbers in my head are, look, if I can dollar cost average into index funds for 50 years, I'll probably end up in the top, maybe 1% of investors, De definitely the top 5% of investors, maybe, maybe the top 1%. And the fact that people r read that and they're like, oh, that's too bad. Morgan doesn't know what he's doing. He's only going to be in the top 1% over time. I, that I think is, <laughs> is, is fascinating to me. Um, so that, 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 that was probably the strongest piece of negative feedback. Including the people who, it was so strong that they said that they can't take the rest of the book seriously because of how I invest. I, I, I think that's interesting. It, you know, it's like, so I'm fascinated by human operating system because we all run it. And like, we consistently make the same mistakes time and time and time again. Intellectually knowing about them doesn't matter. And it's like, this is one of my sadnesses because like I was very early in on the behavioral finance stuff. Like the first paper I wrote, which was horribly written, thank God my summa cum laude in journalism wife started showing me some kindness and editing my work. 
Um, but um, it was all psychology. It was all behavioral finance. They didn't call it behavioral finance in 1986 when I wrote the paper. Yeah. Um, but but then it then it became huge. You know, Danny Kenneman, who I've met, and he's a very charming guy. The cha- and even I think Danny would even admit this. The challenge is, and I know Jason would, for example. The the challenge is, as I see it, that we can intellectually understand something. Like everything you write about in the book is like, to me, and I think probably to you, common sense, right? It's like, yeah. well, yeah, of, of course you, you're gonna do this. But then what happens is all of those, all of that intellectual understanding gets thrown out the window, right? When markets are shitting the bed. Yeah. And, and I, Jason, again, Jason had a great me- metaphor for it. And that was, there's a big difference between showing somebody a picture of a snake and throwing a live sta- snake in their lap. And he yeah, goes, yeah. that latter one is what's gonna happen to you. And I've, and I've had a long career on Wall Street and I have seen this time and time and time again. So do you, like, w- w- what are your thoughts? Is there some kind of like, so my solution to being a human being and, and you know, having the same programming as everyone else was to become a rules-based quant investor you're a rules-based investor too, kind of. Yeah, yeah. No, you know, the, it's the, a the same diagram of how you and I invest is very overlapped. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What, what, what is there a way, in your opinion, that that you could make that you can get through to those people? Is there a way for you to uh, come at it a different way so that they understand, or is it just impossible? No, well, I think. That- uh, it's, it's obvious too, and I'm happy to admit this, there's nothing new or groundbreaking in the slightest in the book. I mean, the book's no. message is like, don't be greedy, compound interest is awesome, save some money. Like it's all, <laughs> this is not rocket science stuff. But if, if, if I think why it may have connected, it's because I tried to tell a story around that. And a thing that I really believe is true for all, everything in the world is that the best story wins. It's not, it's not the best ideas. It's not the right ideas. It's not the complex ideas. It's just the best story wins. I've used this example before of Ken Burns, uh, the, the documentary and his, his documentary on the civil war came out in 1990. And when it came out in 1990, it was such a success. More people watched the civil war documentary in 1990 than watched the Super Bowl that year. It was just like a ridiculous blowout success. And this is a documentary on the civil war, which is like one of the most documented and like, how many books are there on the Civil War? Thousands and thousands. There is nothing new in Ken Burns' documentary. Nothing new. He, this is not like he was the guy to uncover the battle, like, like uncover Gettysburg. Like, he, there's nothing new in there. He just told a really good story about it. An amazing story with captivating music and amazing editing. And because of that, he took an event that everyone had known about and everyone has known the details about. And he got more Americans to tune in than watch the Super Bowl that year. I think there's so many examples of that, of things that everyone knows have been discovered for centuries. Nothing's new, but if you can tell a good story about it, you'll get people's attention. And that is what I think a lot of academics in particular miss, is that they have, they have all the right answers, but they are the worst storytellers. And I think a lot of the times they go, out of, they go out of their way to be bad storytellers because they want to be use big words to fit in with their colleagues, to fit in with the academic tribe. And I think there's so much room to take what academics know and explain it to a lay person in a story that they're likely to remember and likely to hook onto. So much room doing that. I think you could also write a book, not just psychology of money, but you could write the psychology of medicine, the psychology of politics, the psychology of sports, the psychology of relationships, and just talk about things that people intuitively know and tell a story around it in a way that would really connect with them. So that's what I've always tried to do in my writing is like, I, I, re- I don't have the intelligence, the brain power, the education to discover new things in finance. And even for the people who do, I think there's probably not that much to discover left. Like we've, we've, we've overturned almost all the rocks, but I think there's still a lot of room to be made and progress to be made connecting with these people by just doing a better job telling the story. Yeah. And, and so I, I used to say, and again, I'm a quant, right? So everything is numbers, but I used to begin a lot of presentations with, 
I'm going to tell you a story about why you shouldn't make investment decisions using stories. <laughs> That's good. That's good. But 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 the but the, the dominance. If you study evolution, um, we we have been readers for a couple of blinks of the eyes. We we have been watchers and interactors on ma massive networks for you know what is the shortest nanosecond, right? In terms of uh, evolutionary time. And, and so the, the, the pull of a story and a narrative is part, it's in our DNA, right? Oh yeah. And, 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 and so we use and misuse them, obviously. Um, and, you know, kind of one of the funny things uh, in, in, that you notice if you're on the quant side is actually narrative follows price, not the other way around. Yeah. And, 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 and why is that important? Well, it's important because if you are going to build a narrative, say, around AMC and GameStock, um, people are going to love the, uh, the David and Goliath story. I mean, it just screams, ooh, that's catnip, right? Yes. Ooh, yeah. we love it that David is sticking it to Goliath. The, the problem is it's not true. The, the problem is that, you know, anyone who does what I do knows that there were all sorts of associates of hedge funds in those Wall Street bets uh, chat rooms. Oh, and, yeah. Every and they one, were, yeah. Every hedge they, fund was reading it last year. <laughs> yeah. And, and they were what an old timer would call painting the tape. Yeah. In other words, they were, they were making statements that um, may or may not have been true. But they were creating that narrative and creating it intentionally for, for one that really sang. And, and so where, where, where I completely agree with you about the power of stories, but you've got to caveat it, right, about that, you know, some stories are like really, really powerful, but they're wrong. Right. Yes. <laughs> and, and 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 so that gets us into a lot of troubles. I mean, I'm a huge Douglas Adams fan, and and he has this great quote that I'm going to botch it up, but it's like human beings who are uniquely uh, able to learn from the uh, experience of others all all are also incredibly disinclined to do so. <laughs> so, yeah. like. I believe, one of the things that I believe is that I can learn from others. And that's why I read so much and, you know, look at sort of classic blunders and how they apply to, you know, what I do. Do, do you think that that um, that kind of way of approaching, like you, you yourself said, it's very simple, save money, you know, be reasonable, not rational. Um, you, 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 you offered a lot of sort of time tested uh, ideas in your book. Yeah. But, but I'm, I'm trying to get at this question in another way. Um, how do you think we can actually make the end reader or, or listener to this podcast? How can we get through to them that they like, they suddenly like, oh my God, I am my own, my worst enemy, right? Yeah. I, I, I've often thought that 10% um, of, of society does not need any help with their money. Like they just get it intuitively. They're born understanding it. Another 10% cannot be helped with their money. There's compulsive gamblers. No matter what you tell them, say them, they're, they're screwed. I think 80% of society wants and needs good advice. And if you can push them in the right direction, point them in the right direction and, um, and show them like, hey, this is this is what is intuitive to think, but here's what actually works. And here's some data that might change it. You, you, can, actually, you can actually move the needle. The problem is you pointed to earlier is like the difference between learning during a bull market versus experiencing a bear market is night and day, completely night and day. And there, there's, there's a lot that's in the book that kind of leads to that. Like we are products of what we've experienced in life, not what we've read about, not what we think about. We're products of what we have lived through personally. I do think that's there's a lot of truth about that. So, you know, I write this book during the bull market and it's like, hey, there's a price to success in the stock market. You have to be willing to put up with volatility. It's one thing to read that during a bull market and say, oh yeah, that makes sense. I get it. And then the bull market happens and you're like, oh shit, this feels differently than I, than I thought. I think there's, there's so much in finance, all the important things in finance, you can't understand until you've experienced them. That, that's actually a big part of, of the book in, in chapter one. 
But I, I think if you can experience these events with a little bit more insight, with a little bit more knowledge and wisdom about what you're experiencing, it helps. And so much of what matters in investing, this has been true for me personally, for everyone personally, it's like, it's just being introspective about how you think about risk and greed. And in the heat of the moment, when you're like, oh, here's the decision I want to make, you'd be like, well, why am I making that? And is that different than what I used to think and whatnot? It's just becoming introspective of your own feelings and emotions during the heat of the moment. That's really what matters in investing is like what you do 1% of the time when the market is either going crazy up or crazy down, how you behave during that 1% of the time makes all the difference in the world over the course of your life. And you just need to know yourself about, about who you are and, and how you're going to react. So if, if this book and other pieces of content, your work, everyone else's work can make, can push you to become more introspective during those moments, that's how I think you take the 80% of society who wants and needs good advice and just kind of like nudge them in, in, in one direction. I think it's similar to medicine of like, you know, everyone knows like eat a good diet, exercise, sleep eight, sleep eight hours. But when there's a Twinkie in front of you, like you, you're probably going to eat it. But if you could just have a little bit of insight, like what you're supposed to do so that you're not just fully reacting on like your caveman instincts, your impulse instincts all the time, you just have some information in your head to try to nudge you in one direction. I think that's the best that we can do, even if it's imperfect. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, the thing that I was always proudest of uh, over the course of my career was um, the fact that I never let an emotional uh uh, feeling make me override our models yeah. and and like literally being calm is kind of a superpower uh the the my co-chief investment officer chris meredith at osam uh told me not too long ago he goes hey you know remember during the global financial crisis and i went vaguely what <laughs> and and he goes did you notice that i looked in on your office every morning to say good morning and that i hadn't been doing that in the past i went uh, actually, Chris, I didn't notice that, but that was very kind of you. And he goes, no, no, no. He goes, I was doing it for a specific reason. And I went, okay. And he goes, you, if you were calm, I knew that we were going to make it through this. And I'm like, okay. Um, well, <laughs> what if one day, just, just to screw with them one day, you should have started pulling your hair out and throwing yeah, pictures against the wall. Setting, and... <laughs> setting my hair on fire. Well, and, and you know, so I agree completely that one's disposition, one's emotional disposition, um, it, it kind of creates the lion's share of whether you're going to succeed or not. I love yeah. your 10% and 10% example. Um, but there's another thing that you and I share that I think is required if you really want to be able to become introspective, and that is you've got to write about what you think. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and so I, I'm a huge believer because like right before uh, we went on, I was going through an old journal of mine, and I'm always being called a liar in my own handwriting, which is fantastic. You know, our brains, I think, have do these, con what they, what they perceive, they, and obviously I'm anthropomorphizing our brain. They don't perceive it that way, but a kindness is we update memories to make them consistent with what we believe now. And we do this unconsciously. And I wouldn't believe that if I hadn't 30 years of journals to prove that that's what we do. And yeah. so I think that if you can't write something out, you and I know you believe this, you can't, you don't understand it. So my yeah. first step always is right in, in my opinion, writing is thinking, right? And and one of the things that um, you know people fall prey to all the time is if they don't they don't don't do that, right? They're they're they are going to fall prey to all of the behavioral biases. You know, Kierkegaard said life. Uh, can only be understood backwards, but we have to live it forwards. Yep. And and so I think that like writing is integral to to getting people to do that. Do you, I mean you write every day? Is there is there is there a trick for non writers out there that you could share? Like if you just do this, you'll like you said, you're, you're going to be in the upper five percent 
of all returns by the time you're my age, probably. I don't know, I don't know if there's a trick other than just saying you, you have to go, you, you should write. Everyone should write. Even if it's just a journal that no one else is reading, but you, it's good because writing is what, is what transfers gut feelings into the real world. And there, everyone has gut feelings where you're like, I know this is true. I know this is the right answer. I know this is it. And then if you go down, if you force yourself to put it into words, one of two things happens. You either, lead, you, you either see that gut feeling, you're like, oh, now I understand it better. Now, yeah. I, I, now I really get it. Or you put it into words and you're like, wait a minute, that's ridiculous. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> right. or, or, or even you try to put it in your words and you're like, I can't put this into words because it's so ridiculous. I can't even force the words on the paper. And that's, yeah. that's, when, that's what writing really does to you. It's like, it's a way to bring gut feelings into the world in yeah. a way that I think is really important. One, one of the big flaws, this is true for everyone who's ever written a book, it's easy for the reader to think, wow, this person had all of this insight in their head before they wrote the book. And writing the book was just, they just like downloaded their brain in the paper. It's like, that's never, that has never once in human history ever been the case. No. <laughs> Every book that's ever been written is an author who had an idea for a book. And then they're like, okay, let me grind the gears in my head and try to figure this topic out as I go <laughs> is always what it is. Yep. And so that's, that's the price. So maybe the author had a bunch of gut feelings about what they thought was, should be true in the world. And then in the process of writing it, they converted those gut feelings into words. And that process is so enlightening and powerful for everyone. This is why journaling is so great because you're just taking the emotions and the hardships and the ups and downs of everyday life and not only recording them for posterity, but also like actually codifying them into the world and being like, here's what this actually means. Here's the rules of what I've, I've, I've dealt with in a way that I think is really uh, powerful. Now, if you're a professional writer, then you're kind of forced to do it anyways. And I always feel like my, my blog for the last 15 years has just been like a, a running show of what I'm thinking about that week. So I feel like that's just, that's just my emotions just put out there. But I think everyday journaling, which it sounds like you've been doing for a long time, uh, I, I don't do that, but I, I kind of wish that I that I would and 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 had done that because I think that's a really powerful way to understand what you're thinking. Yeah, and uh, the the challenge is getting in the habit, right? So, like James Clear, I had on the podcast, you know, like you should read his book Atomic Habits because yeah. if you can make something, if you can habituate something, it just becomes so much easier than if you can't. So, like the first 25 days might suck. You you might not want to do it. But yeah. if, you, if you actually, I actually did a thread on Twitter about how to create habits because they're just easier. Like if you're not thinking about it and you're just doing it, it just becomes part of your day and it's, and it's not a big deal. Um, I want to get back to the book though, because so the, the example of the janitor was misinterpreted, uh, misperceived. Um, I'm, I'm surprised about the people who get to the end of the book and they see that you're a rules-based investor in indexing and then just like, well, fuck this guy. <laughs> you know, I wanted to see the, you know, whatever. That surprises me because like, I'm a believer in what I do, but if people don't want to do what I do, the next thing I recommend is to index your money because it's very, very simple and hey, it works. Um, is, there, is there anything that like, jumps out at you and and this is kind of an impossible question but like what it has been when people come up to you after a talk or um podcast people uh, after the recording button has has stopped uh, is there some kind of common question and or um statement that you thought that you just heard again and again and again I think one thing that I hear fairly often, and we spoke about this earlier in this podcast, is people who say something along the lines of like, that's what I've always believed, but you put it into words for me, which just gets back to like, there's absolutely nothing unique in this. This is not the news trading strategy. It's just like an everyday common sense that I hope to try to put into a way that you will remember because it's told in a story and understand better because I explained it simply. That's all I, I've, I've ever wanted wanted to do. I think that's, that's a common um, takeaway from there as well. I do think there's also something interesting with the book. And this is a slightly different topic, but um, the feedback over time, I think has gotten better, which is interesting because it's the same book. Yeah. <laughs> like when it first came out, the feedback, feedback was like, oh, this is like, it's, it's okay. It's, it's fine. 
And then it's gotten better because I think that's like the classic halo effect in psychology of once, once people, if people read it with this sense of like, I'm supposed to think this book is good. And when mm -hmm. you start it with that lens, then it's easier to say, oh yeah, you're right. I like this too. Cause everyone else liked it. The same thing happens, can happen in the other way with companies where you're like, I'm, I'm supposed to hate this company because everyone else does. So right. I think that's, that's been interesting as well. And that's true. That's a powerful thing in life with people, with companies, with books, with blogs of like, other people told me to like this. So now I'm going to like it automatically, I think is, yeah. is a really power is, is that's a, that's always been interesting to me to see the feedback get better over time for the exact same book. Um, well, yeah. So that's momentum and mimetic desire. Uh, yes, the, that's exactly. what's causing both of those. And yep. uh, it's like, it, it's fascinating to me because it leads to the halo effect. I, I, I kind of knew that going in. I knew that like I had to write what works on wall street because you had to be an expert. And the only way back in the nineties to be an expert was to have a book. Um, and back then you had to get through the gatekeepers. Um, and now younger people, they don't have to necessarily. Um, you know, I think there is still a distinction between having a publisher like we do um, and self-publishing something. But I think that the um, bias against that is lessening as- I, I think it's almost, I think it's almost not there in the, in the, in the slightest. David Goggins, who wrote a book that sold a zillion copies, that's effectively self-published. He, used a, he yeah. used a publisher that kind of does the admin work for you, but he effectively self-published that. I don't think, I've, I've never, you're a big reader, I'm a big reader. I've never picked up a book and been like, oh, this looks great and I heard it's great, but who's the publisher? Oh, no, I don't want to read it anymore. <laughs> Nobody does that. No one's no, ever I done know. that. And if you ask like, what are your favorite books of all time? And if I said, name the publisher from those books, nobody cares. Nobody cares. No. So I think, I think particularly in the world <laughs> where you can drive your own distribution through social media, mm -hmm. um, there, I, 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 love, I love my publisher, Harriman House. They're wonderful people. But I think the, the publisher's value in the world, it's, it's not zero, it's there, but it's diminished from what it used to be. Now that an author can have their own audience, their own distribution. Yeah. And I think we're doing a, a series called The Great Reshuffle about all the changes that are happening. Um, and that's one of them. Uh, the, the tools that are now available to people uh, online are simply staggering when you yeah. look at what it, what it took me to found O'Shaughnessy Capital uh, Management in 1986 it was incredibly expensive. I had to go to the regulator's office. I had to like go to a marble quarry and find the piece of marble that I wanted a photograph taken up for my brochure. I mean, it was like yeah. the Stone Age. And, and yeah. now like all of these tools are available. So like, if you want to write a book, you want to start a company, you want to do any of that, you can basically do it all online. And, you know, it's become a lot easier. So I'm, I'm like really in favor of a lot. Now there's a bunch of bad stuff that might happen too, but the idea of a meritocracy is never, in my opinion, been, been clearer. Yeah. Not, this is not, not a good age for middlemen. Um, no. that's, that's not, that's not a blanket statement because there are some that still add a lot of value and will continue whether it's like regulatory capture or they're just actually really good at what they do. But in general, not a good age to be just someone who sits in the middle, capturing someone's value, not, not a good time to be. And I'm, I'm not a, a crypto guy myself. I'm not, I'm not against crypto, but I think that's the central message of crypto is like, is, a, is it really comes down to like cut out the middleman, whether it's the middleman who's censoring or who's just skimming off the top, um, cut them out. And I think that message in general, hey, that's that's been going on for for a decade or two. But I think that's a that's an important, powerful message as well. You see it in books, music, movie, like everything is just not not a good age for middlemen. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And uh, they're not happy about it because there is a lot of middlemen. Uh, a, lot of them. a lot of them make, uh, make a really good make a really good living doing it so they're going to go yeah. out kicking and screaming yeah they are and you can see them having their tantrums right now you mentioned crypto um so you're not a big crypto guy uh do you foresee any time where you would deviate from your standard um allocations to the vanguard funds and include a broader group of assets or no I, I don't I don't rule it out in the slightest. I don't rule anything out because I know how much I've changed in the past. So to right. assume that I'm not going to change in the future is ridiculous. I don't, so I don't rule anything out, including that I might completely dump all the Vanguard funds and do something totally different. I don't think it's likely, but I don't rule it out at all. 
So mm -hmm. it's the same with 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 crypto. And my, my views on crypto are not positive. I'm, I just come firmly down the center of like I think it's fascinating to watch. I think if you if you underestimate the number of very smart people going into it who are trying to solve problems and build companies around this, if you're just viewing it as the price action and like ah oh, tulip bubble ah, I think you're, you're missing how much innovation is taking place. And if you just focus on the innovation, if you're just focusing on how much is doing, then you're missing like how much insanity and outright fraud is going in that can suck the life out of the industry through regulation and and otherwise that's like the both the two sides that i come down you it's of course it's fascinating to take something that didn't exist a decade ago and now it's worth trillions of dollars that in itself if it just ended right there is just staggeringly fascinating to watch i also think from a psychology perspective a lot of the arguments that get put forth around it for it pro crypto I feel like you could drive a truck a mile through them. And so it's always going to be the case that whenever you have a group of people who have made dynastic fortunes over the course of a year or two are going to think uh, crazy things about the assets that they own. I think that's always been the case and always will be the case. So I understand why it happens. I think it's just interesting to watch. Yeah, I, I, as do I, I'm pretty much in that same category. Uh, we made some investments. I'm a big skin in the game believer. Uh, and because I don't, I'm not going to really pay attention unless I have some skin in the game. And so we actually, after Patrick's hash series, I we were in a in a lobby at a family event, and I looked at him. We had a half an hour before the bus came to pick up the entire family, and I'm like, "All right, in a half an hour, explain crypto to me." <laughs> and he actually did a really good job. And I'm like, "So this is in 2017," and so I'm like, "So should I be looking at this?" And he goes, "Yeah, you definitely should be looking at this." And so. We made an investment um, in a actually a crypto hedge fund because I, I like the idea that as far as I could tell, crypto was pure momentum play. And yeah. like, so a, a hedge fund that can short the, the bad shit coins and go long the other ones, it, right? So anyway, <laughs> the funny thing that happened was literally a month after we made the investment, we got the, um, we got the uh, statement it had lost 50% of its value in one month. <laughs> and I'm like, so the thing that my first learning on this is it's very volatile. Uh, it ended up being fine. But I wanted to ask you about volatility because you, I've seen you say in a number of uh, uh, posts that you've done and in a number of interviews that you've done that volatility, you don't view volatility as risk. And I do. So let explain to me why you don't view it as risk. Well, I think it 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 is risk if the volatility is forcing your behaviors into do something that becomes risky, primarily selling. Then it's <laughs> definitely risk. I think I think you I think it's possible to view volatility in a way that is not risk. And then think and I think it's possible to view it as the cost of admission to doing well over time. Which is if you want an, a, an investment with no volatility, that exists. You can get an FDI shared savings account and there's zero volatility, you have no risk and you have zero upside. And if you want upside, you have to pay the price, the cost of admission, which is volatility. But it definitely is risk if the volatility forces you to sell. And a lot of people, it does. And so that, that's why volatility is taking place is because people are selling. So it's kind of, it's, so I, that, I, I think there's probably actually more common ground between what you and I believe than people think. And it's easy for me to say, don't view it as a risk, view it as a cost of admission. And I think some people, once that's explained, like, oh, okay, I kind of get it. But this is again, a thing where it's like, you have to just live through a period of your portfolio falling 30 or 50% to see what it does to your psyche and what it does to your confidence and what it does to your uh, social behavior of your spouse thinks differently of you because <laughs> they used to think you were an investing guru and now all of a sudden you're down 50%. So that's, that has a big impact on people that I think until you've lived through it and yeah. see how it might affect you and push you to decisions that might be risky is, is, is a totally different thing than just writing about it. Well, there's, a, there's an old saying on Wall Street, and that is that during bear markets, stocks return to their rightful owners. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And, I, I, and, I'm, I'm curious, so Jim, can, can you explain why it is risk? Like, do you, is, there, is there actually a difference between what you and I think? No. Actually, uh, well, there's a there's a, a slight technical difference, but the the majority of the points you made is mine, uh, and that is volatility shakes makes people do things that they ultimately regret deeply. 
Yes. Um, and because they've made emotional decision making, um, and the, the, their fear drove them out, or you know, greed drove them in. Um, and so the the inherent difficulty of withstanding volatility is something that I do not take lightly. And I have seen, because I've been around, right? And so I was there for the 87 crash. I was there for the, uh, the uh, 97 uh, default of all the emerging country debt, uh, the dot bomb, uh, the great financial you were, crisis. You were there during the Civil War, the Revolutionary War, the Big Bang, the whole thing. <laughs> you were there the whole time. Exactly, exactly. I, I, I have been a vampire. I was turned, I think, about 1,500 years ago, if, I, if I'm correct. Uh, and, but, but see, the interesting thing is, like, that's my message. The, the last sustainable edge is to arbitrage human nature. And like yeah. one of the points that you make, which I totally agree with, but I have a different, slightly different take on, is that studying history is a great guide, not because that's going to happen again, but because humans are going to react the same way again. Oh, right? yeah. Like, yeah. Like, like all innovations, like humans act exactly the same way. In 1900, there were 200 car manufacturers um, in America. Right, and what are there two or one now? I, I guess Tesla is still considered one. Uh, yeah. You write about the Wright brothers. I love that piece, by the way. But what I love about it is nobody paid any attention to it. I mean, literally one of the greatest discoveries. Nobody I mean, cared for years. For years, nobody cared. No, nobody cared. Nobody cared. They didn't write about it in the newspapers. There's even a period where the Wright brothers were when they went back to Dayton, Ohio, where they're from. And they're flying over people's houses, like through the middle of Main Street, and nobody cared. <laughs> nobody cared. No, no, it's so. It's just, they did the same thing with the car, the same thing with the computer, the same thing with antibiotics. Of like, it's there's only there's never been an invention that was fully, um, uh, fully respected and 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 fully appreciated for what it would become when it first came out. Never, and there never will be. To, 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 the to opposite, point about, right? It's ahead, the opposite. Please. It's so easy to make fun of it when it comes out. Exactly. But there, this quote that I've used a thousand times, I don't want to keep using it forever and ever, but I think it's great from Voltaire who says, history never repeats itself, but man always does. Yes. Like, like the, the <laughs> details of history will never repeat themselves. They never have, they never will. But human behavior is, is just ingrained in stone. It's going to be the same. Yeah. I'm actually, yeah. my, my, next, my, my next book is on this topic. It's about the behaviors that never change over time. Oh, I love that. Because that you know that that that's my sort of saying, which is um, in in and I marry it to the fact that we're deterministic thinkers. But basically, so so that one is we're deterministic thinkers living in a probabilistic world, and generally hilarity or tragedy often ensue. But then the that married to markets change second by second, human nature barely budges millennia by millennia. <laughs> where's the disconnect arbitraging human nature is your last sustainable edge but now you've got me yeah. like really interested in this next book so yeah. what, what 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 can you can you give away a little bit about the next book no that's that's pretty much it um it's about the human behaviors that never change like what was true primarily in business and investing but also just other areas of life what was true 100 years ago that will be true 100 years from now that's just an ingrained part of how people behave and the things that they do, and the big kind of models of how the world works that, are, that you can't break. And right. I think we focus too much on what's going to change. What are the new technologies? What are the, who's gonna be the next president? Where's the economy going? Where's the, and that stuff's good. I don't, it's, not that, it's not that I dis, that I think it was bad, but I yeah. think we need to focus more on what does not change. Because the things that change are almost impossible to predict, but we know with 100% certainty how people are going to respond over the next 50 years and yep. the things that they're going to fall for, for better or worse, we know what those things are going to be with 100% certainty. And if, if there was something, if there was something in the economy that we could forecast with hundred percent certainty, like that's, that's really powerful. But when the next recession is, it's not something that we can predict with hundred percent certainty or, or, or 20% certainty, but there are all these behaviors that I would bet 100% will replay over the course of my life and your life. So if yep. you can focus on what those behaviors are, what they mean, how to see them coming, how to react when they happen, 
I think that's the best that we can actually do to forecast. So kind of the core of the book, I don't make this explicit, but kind of the theme is here's the way that you can actually forecast the future. It's like, do they, they, you want to actually see the future? There's only one way to do it. And it's focusing on the behaviors that you know are going to repeat, not the details that you pretend you can see coming. Exactly. And, you know, you've just outlined my, all of the things that I have tried to recalibrate on understanding human OS. That's what I work on because you're absolutely right. Uh, you had a great quote somewhere where it was like, you know, uh, we, we, judge innovations generationally. Why are we looking at the companies making those innovations quarterly? Yeah, that was, <laughs> a, story from, that was a story from Larry Fink, uh, the CEO of BlackRock, who many years ago, he said he had lunch with the CEO of a large sovereign wealth fund. And the CEO of the sovereign wealth fund said, we measure uh, our, 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 you know, he said, our goals are generational. We're investing money for the next generation, the generation yeah. after that. And Larry Fink said, that's great. How do you measure your returns? And the CEO said quarterly. <laughs> like, like, and I think that that disconnect between things like has a lot to do with just how the world works. I would also say too, it's easy to poke fun at that story, but I, I understand why returns are measured quarterly. You can't, it's hard to hire an asset manager and just say, go do whatever you want. You want to lose money for the next 10 years. Go have that. I don't care. I'm a long-term investor. That's just not, that's, that, that's not a practical way to do things. I think short-term returns sometimes are the only way to make sure that the fund manager that you've hired or you're, you're investing your money with is not just full of shit. And right. that's, that's, the, that's what's imperfect about investing. And that's why saying I'm a long-term investor is easier said than done, particularly if you are having someone else invest your money. So I, I understand why it happens, but I also think it's just easy to point out the absurdity of it. But like a lot of things in life, things, things are never going to be perfect. There's always going to be a big disconnect between the ideal and what actually works in practice. And I think that that's just one of them. So, so have you, uh, I mean, with all of your success um, and obviously you've done very well financially with the book and with, with other things, have you changed at all? Or have, are you still the same Morgan? Because I, I'm going to tell us an out of school story and I can remove it if you don't want people to know this, but do you remember the car ride we took together about four or five years ago? And I was trying to convince you to like, hey, Morgan, you got to bet bigger. You got to like swing Bigly, to the fences. Yeah, we, Do you remember we, that? I, I know we've had, we've had a couple of these conversations where um, you try to convince me to not be a tightwad anymore. <laughs> right. but, but you were very consistent in your answer, uh, which I respected and thought like you were, a, you, your self-awareness was a, a very high score for such a young person. Have, have, have any of the events or now I know you have two kids now and you you own your house and you don't have a mortgage on it and uh, Gretchen doesn't work, um, but any changes from like- The, the only before? thing we've changed is we have a bathtub filled with hundred dollar bills and I soak in it every uh, morning. That's, well, who, who, yeah, who doesn't have that though? <laughs> I'm kidding. No, I, you, I, I would be lying if I said there were no changes, but they've been pretty subtle. Um, so like, I, I think if you, if you looked at our household spending today versus before the book, like, yeah, it's, it's, it's up there. It, 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 it's, it's grown, but not in any like major significant way. We were very happy and content before the book. It's not like we were just like itching to get our big payday and then we would go out and do the things we wanted to do. We did everything we wanted to do before the book and the house we bought before the book and like all those things. To me, the biggest, the biggest point here is that what makes people happy the, the, the biggest things that make you happy really have nothing to do with money. It's like, do you get along with your spouse? Are you raising good kids? Are you in a job that lets that gives you the, the ability to be creative and have fun? Can you spend time with your friends? Are you getting enough sleep? Are you, do you have time to exercise? That's what actually makes you happy. And those things don't make any difference at all, whether you've had some windfall or not. Yeah. So I think I, we focus on that, on that a lot. There have, I'll tell you, there have been times after the book where I'm like, okay, let's go spoil myself and go buy X, Y, and Z. And I know this is going to happen, but it's like, I, I'm ultimately disappointed with what, with, with, what, with what comes from it. But it's, it's important to remind yourself of that once in a while, to yeah. be like, to, to, re, to remind yourself that you are actually not holding back from something that's going to make you happy. And it's important to test the boundaries too, of like, there are some things that like you spend money on and they actually do make you happier, whether it's like, oh, you're going to take your friend out to a nice restaurant. You're really going to enjoy that. It's well worth the money. You're going to enjoy it. 
So it's important to test your spending once in a while to just make sure that you're not holding back from it. But in general, it really we, we, we live the same life that we did before the book. And I think that'll last for a while. The one thing that we had not done before the book at all, and I wasn't proud of this, I just hadn't really figured it out, is philanthropy, that we've started dipping our toes into in, in a way that I think will, will grow. And I think, I think that's something that will give us a level of happiness that we've yet to experience as well. Yeah, I, I think it does. Um, and I've been doing that for a long time, but uh, it, 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 honestly, kind of selfish reasons, I do it because it makes me feel good. And <laughs> I think if, you, if you're willing to just admit that and, and don't like say, look at how virtuous I am, yeah. uh that's not gonna that's that's gonna actually make you unhappy but if yeah you I, th admit, I think i think the reason that philanthropy is such a big thing is because it makes the donor feel so good i think that's yeah. fine to that's fine to admit there's nothing yeah. wrong with that yeah and and you know i'm reminded of tolstoy's uh quote in uh you know all happy families are alike in exactly the same way all unhappy families are unique <laughs> yeah. um yeah. and 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 so that's an interesting thing but I think that that kind of uh, implies that we can learn things from like uh, a certain like segment of people. I happen to believe that it revolves around self-awareness, um, uh, realization that happiness is not an end state in itself. It is a byproduct of doing interesting things that you enjoy in your life, being with interesting people whom you love and respect. And, and this idea that, oh, I want to be happy and this will make me happy. That's wrong. No, yeah, it yeah. won't. The thing, the thing to, that people miss about happiness is that it's always a fleeting emotion. And the example I like is if, if, if I told you the funniest joke in the world, you've never heard a funnier joke you're not going to laugh for 20 years straight. You're going to laugh for about 30 <laughs> seconds. And then you're like, okay, I get it. And if I repeated that joke to you every day, you'd be like, stop, I get it. It's not funny anymore. I've heard this a million times. It's the same with happiness. It's a very fleeting emotion. It's not to say that you can't find it, but you have to understand that it's fleeting. And the so, things that you're going to do. Yep. I got to tell you one story though, that, that negates what you're saying a little bit. Okay. All right. My, my, my daughter, my youngest daughter, Lael is a stand-up comedian. And uh, she, uh, did you ever see the movie, This Is The End with, um, with Seth Rogen and that whole crew? I don't think so, no. Okay, okay, so it's hysterical, you should watch it. Um, it Cause it's the end of the world. It's the, uh, the book of revelations, the Satan walks the earth and everything. <laughs> and there, there is a line from that movie that, um, uh, that uh, he records after being violated in ways that you can't imagine by a, a, a demon. <laughs> He's doing a self-recording and he opens it by looking up at the camera and saying, so something not so chill happened last night. And literally my daughter knows that if she says that to me, if, even if I'm in the worst mood in the world, I will start laughing. <laughs> Yeah, but see, but see, I think this is actually my point because you did not wake up this morning thinking of that story. No, I did not. So, like, so I think with a lot of things that make you happy too, like if you have good, successful, happy kids, if you force yourself to think about that, you might be like, ah, oh, that's great. I love it. I'm so proud of them. But by and large, the, you, you kind of have to force those thoughts in a way. It's not just going to stick with you 24-7 in the way that you don't laugh about that joke 24-7. Right, I right. think that's what people miss about it. There are ways to, that you can situate your life. I, 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 think, I think this is, this is kind of the, the detail here. I read a little bit about this in the book. A lot of happiness is removing the bullshit from your life. It's not necessarily adding the nirvana. It's just subtracting the bullshit. And I think people like Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, those guys, I think they probably have fewer bad days than your average middle-class American, but I don't think yeah. they have more good days. That's mm -hmm. important. Like subtracting the bad days is great because like Bill Gates doesn't have to like get the oil changed on his car. He doesn't have to like, he, like take, just subtract the bullshit. But I think all of those guys do not have a greater number of good days than your average typical typical middle class American. Yeah, that's a great way to look at it too, because um, 
it's it's so many people get tripped up on this hedonic treadmill. You know, if I just work a little harder, I'm going to be able to get that car, and that car is going to make me feel good. No, it's actually not. Yeah. And and so this idea of um, of things making us happier, I think, is really wrong. And you know, I've said that to people, and they're like, "Oh, well, easy for you to say, Jim." You know, like uh, I sure would say that if I was driving X car or had this amount of money. And I'm like, you're missing the point here. The, the, the point is, I, you, you're right. I do have that really nice car. And you know what? It doesn't make me happy. You know what makes me happy is my family and my grandchildren and my friends and interacting with them and experiences, right? So yeah. like even Danny Kenneman would say, there's the experiencing self and the remembering self. And he would be like, if you want to be like really happy, do things that the remembering self is going to love. And even, I, even experiences though can get kind of quirky because most of most of the happiness that you get from experience comes from anticipation. Yes. You're going to get more joy out of anticipating your vacation than you do actually when you're there. Because yes. when you are anticipating it, you if you if you anticipate going to Hawaii next week. You are like, oh, I can see myself sitting on the beach, soaking up the sun with a margarita, just like enjoying it. But then when you actually get to the beach, you're like, oh, all the umbrellas are taken and I got sunscreen in my eye and I got heartburn from the meal last night and my kids are yelling at me and, and I stub my toe. Like, like the context of what it actually is like means yeah. that it's always going to feel less than you anticipated of what it would be. And what's really funny is you're absolutely right. So... It's the anticipation of the trip. When you actually are on the trip, you're not you're not really terribly happy. But when it's done, you you erase all of those the bugs and the umbrellas not being you, there. You, you take it all away. You kick it all away, and you oh boy, that trip was so the fun. the the, <laughs> the dumbest. Some of the dumbest thoughts I've ever had in my life is when I'm on vacation and I think about how great it's going to be to come back. <laughs> I'll be like literally in the middle of a trip and I'll be like, God, next summer I get to come back here. And that's so cool. And I'm like, this is the dumbest thought that's ever crossed my mind. But I think that's how people are wired. I think that's how it works. A lot of that, like the science behind that is like dopamine is the anticipatory hormone. That's it's just getting you to want more of whatever you're experiencing, not to enjoy what you're experiencing. It's to get you to be like, I want more of this. I want more and more and more. And that's why yeah, when yeah. you're in Hawaii, you, you dream about coming back to Hawaii. It's the right. craziest <laughs> It's the craziest thing that you can't help but laugh about like how dumb you can be in that moment, but it's true. That's how people think. Uh, Robert Anton Wilson has a great uh, quote. He was like 50 years ahead of his time, but his quote goes along the lines of, if you for even a moment wonder if you're just a big cosmic schmuck, you are for that instant and that instant alone, a little less of a cosmic schmuck. <laughs> how true. So, yeah. Yeah. So it's like, the, 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 the getting back to like what you've learned, et cetera. Is there something from the book that after all the feedback, after all that kind of stuff, other than the, the janitor thing, is there something from the book that you were like, God damn it. I really would have loved to have said this instead of that. Is there anything glaring or, or uh, no? I don't know if there's that if there's that much, I almost wish I had left out the part about how I invest because it sucks that people took that as a way to, to negate everything else that, that, that they read. Although there's part of me that's like, no, that's, that, that's the argument for making sure it's there. Like yeah. if, if people think that that's, that, that, you know, cancels out everything else I wrote, like that says more about them than me, like no, yeah. no, no problem. But it, it, um, I think other than the gender thing, I don't know if there's that much. I think here's one thing that I know is going to be true is that if you and I have this conversation 20 years from now, mm -hmm. uh, half the book I'll disagree with or, yeah. or half of it, I'll be like, oh, here's what I was missing. Um, I, I, I don't know which half it's going to be, but I know right. that's going to be the case. And I think that's true for almost, for almost anyone who writes a book. If, if 20 years after you write a book, you still think it's great, like you're, just, you're, you're, not, being, you're not being introspective enough, you're not learning enough. And right. I know there's going to be things that I learn about myself and learn about the world and learn about investing. And there's going to be new stories and events that happen over the next 20 years that I can't foresee. But when they happen, I'm going to be like, oh, maybe I wasn't appreciating this and that enough. I don't know what that's going to be, but I know that's going to be the case.
So the book's yeah. been out for eight for 18 months. So I don't know if there's that much yet, but I know with certainty that in 20 years, there's going to be parts that I'm like, ah, oh, that's, that's not relevant anymore. I was overlooking this. I was underestimating that. Yeah. So that leads me to a question that I get asked a lot. And I'm interested in your answer. You have two kids. Um, have, have you put any, uh, have you and Gretchen put any thought in like the way you're going to be raising them, what you're going to do in terms of money, in terms of getting them to understand the whole spectrum? Have you given that thought? Here's what's hard about that. Because the answer is yes, but here's what's really hard about that is that we don't know who they're going to be when they're young adults. Yeah. And it's, po it's possible that my daughter wants to become president of the United States or a partner at Goldman Sachs. It's possible she wants to be an English teacher in Guatemala. And like, it's, it's, it's just impossible to know what your kids are going to be. It's impossible that our kids, I hope not, knock on wood, turn out to be not so great adults that cannot be trusted with some amount of money. Like the, the, all of those options are, are, are possible. And therefore, I think making a plan, there's a line I use in the book, the most important part of a plan is planning on your plan, not going according to plan. Right. So I think it, it, like my, our, kids are, our kids are two years old and six years old. So if I were to make a plan about here's how much money I'm going to give you when you're this age, I think it's just not, I think it should be left flexible and left open. I definitely, I, I've spoken about this before, like the Buffett quote of give your kids enough money so they can do anything, but not so much that they can do nothing. Yeah. Is great. And so it's like, I, I don't want to be a propellant for them. I'm not just going to say, here's some money, like go live a great life. But if I can be the world's best um, uh, safety net, like, cool, that's, I want to be, if I can be a, a, a reckless venture capitalist and invest money in your business, that's never going to work. Like I, I'm, I'm probably <laughs> fine doing that. Uh, things like that. And I want to make sure my, that my kids are never going to fall too hard on their face. I'll let them fail a little bit. But they're never going to be in a point where they're like, my life is miserable because I don't have enough more money to afford this necessity. I'll make sure that yeah. they're never at that. But other than that, they got to find their own way. I think that's really important to make I, sure that you're not just spoiling your kids and inadvertently turning them in into little shits because they never had to learn the hard lessons on their own. Ah, uh, you know, that's why I think you and I get along so well, because, uh, you know, when I was raising our kids, my wife and I talked about it a lot. And we had similar uh, thoughts that you just mentioned. We have no idea what they're going to be like, you know, yeah. when they're when they're adults. And so we decided on a rule that negated a ton of things that I thought, at least, um, were not the right way to parent. And the rule was, we want our children to be great adults. Yes. So 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 essentially, when you when you say, my goal is to raise children who become great adults, your behavior becomes much more limited. You can't say things like, because I said so. You can't say, my house, my rules. You, you, you have to engage with the child and, and like say, well, why do you want to do that? And okay, well, do you have a reason for that? And you know, it worked out pretty well. It, I, I'm very lucky. In, in the three kids that, that I'm super proud of. Um, and the other thing that I always did was I always tried, we didn't have Google <laughs> when they were younger. Um, so they used me as Google and like, dad, how, you know, what, why is this? And I always pointed at the bookcase and I said, look it up in there. And so like those two things worked out pretty well, but I, I, I so agree with your statement that we, you don't know. And like, it's, it's hard for a parent to even entertain the idea that yeah. like, yeah, you know, that in oh. including, I would say, and everyone who's listening, who has multiple kids will agree with this. This is nothing insightful, but my, my two-year-old daughter and six-year-old son could not be more different, could oh. not be more different we, in their personality and their desires. It's like completely night and day. And I think everyone who has multiple kids would say that. So that's when it's like, I think I would shake my head if someone was like, here's the exact format for how I'm going to give money to my kids and help my kids. Like, no, 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 that doesn't, it doesn't work like that. Yeah. And we used to joke, we have three. And so Patrick's the oldest. We had him when we were 24. So I used to joke that when people asked me why I was so young, when I had my first child, I was like, I wanted to be able to him to like the same music I liked uh, and, and feed me all the new stuff. 
Uh, I feel like for your generation, though, 24 was not young. That was like the normal time. That was like you were you were a late bloomer at that for that generation, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's inter- that's a whole different discussion because there is a guy, Jonathan Pontel, who's a demographer, who basically makes a really solid case for the fact that even though I'm included as a baby boomer, I'm not really a baby boomer. You're you're I'm, like a, a you're like a junior boomer. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, and and so. Um, but by that time, it was young, even at the time. Yeah. People were like, whoa. I definitely know for, um, what's it called? The greatest generation, the boomers' parents. If you were not married by 19, it was like, what are you doing with your life? <laughs> exactly. it, was a, it was a very, and if you didn't have kids by 21, it was like, well, so you're a failure. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you know, that, and that, that uh, your observation about uh, the kids having very different personalities, Patrick and my daughter, Kate, exactly the same very different and and we used to joke because there was seven years difference between our final child Lael um and Kate um and people were like oh so you can have another child and it's like why and we're like we want to see if they truly are polar opposites Kate and Patrick (laughs) Um, and and then of course Lael came along and she was a mix of the two which is very very funny but I I do think that what I love about you and, and your message is that like, be self-aware, don't overcomplicate. I mean, if, if, if like I could give anyone like advice, it would be know yourself because so few people, cause you know, that's not necessarily a comfortable exercise. And like you, we all have, like Tony DeMello says, if you want to know what your own faults and flaws are, look at what annoys you and other people. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> completely. I so agree with that. Yeah. And there's, there's a lot of time. I think that self-awareness of when somebody annoys you rather than being like, Oh, I, I can't stand that person. Think deeply about the times when you have done that exact same behavior. The highest of which I think the most prevalent of which is when people brag I, I want to vomit. I can't stand it. It's so gross. And then I think like, how do I brag? Like, yeah, I probably do. And I should really cut down on that. That's, that's what I try to do the most. Cause it's so unappealing and nothing is more appealing than humility. Right. And I think here's the thing for most people, if you are successful, if you have great traits, people will learn about them on their own and learning about them on their own is going to be so much more beneficial to you than if you force those traits down their throat. Yep. <laughs> you know? And the, uh, the other thing is, is like, if you're truly honest, uh, what you learn is all of the events of your life teach you humility yeah. <laughs> because you know, I, 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 I've been so wrong about so many things that like, you know, one of the mo- my most common lines is, I don't know. Right. Yeah. And, and, and so, uh, the, 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 uh, the go-to for many people is, my opinion is this, and that's a fact. And anyone who disagrees with me is wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and you know that's all kind of emotional. And and so we're 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 getting a a little long here. I, I have a couple more questions about the book, and then I have the, the final question. If if you like, if if somebody hired you, right, and they're like Morgan Housel, we loved your your book we want you to come and spend a weekend with our kids. Do you, is there a list? Like, do you have a go-to list that, that you would talk to kids or adults? It doesn't have to be kids. It can be like, you know, my brother, Tim, he's fucking awful on money. Will you come? I'll pay you and everything, but is there like a program? Yeah, I, I've, I've done this a couple of times with high net worth families that hire me to come talk to their kids. I love it. It's so much fun. I don't, but I don't, prep what I'm going to say, because back to everyone's different. I feel like you can't, you, you just have to get to know the person and do it and, and do it that way. The other thing is that nobody wants a lecture, but everyone likes a good conversation. Everyone likes a good story. So if you can, particularly with young kids, if you can sit down with them and this is like, Hey, this is not, this is not a classroom session. This is not a chalkboard and I'm going to lecture you. Let's just chat. Let's just say, I want to get to know you. And like, let's just have a conversation that opens up people. I mean, one analogy that I use, I think the best way to interview someone for a job is to take them for a walk. 
and just talk to them, not to interrogate them from the other side of the table. It's just be like, hey, you want to grab a coffee, go for a walk. That's how you get to yep. know somebody. And yep. so that's what I, I try to do with these when, when, I, when I've done this a couple of times. It's just like, how can I get to know this person? And it's almost like a therapy session. I'm not a therapist, of course, but it's almost just like, hey, tell me what you're thinking. And as I say it, sometimes I'll interrupt and be like, hey, you know what? You said this. Let me tell you about this little thing. Let me tell you a story about this. And then I'll let them keep going from there. I just try to like interject here and there to try to push them in, in a different way. That's the only way you're going to get through, particularly young people, rather than, hey, your grandparents hired me to lecture you for the next hour. <laughs> that's, that's never going to work. If you, if you want to kill it, <laughs> that you would say that. Yes. I could yeah. not agree more. And like uh, almost all of my best ideas I had when I was out on a walk. And always like, yeah this is I, actually there's like science behind that about like your brain is more alert because you have to make sure that you're not tripping over logs right. and you have to make sure that the cars aren't going to hit you whereas when you're sitting at your desk your, your brain your brain can shut off because there's nothing threatening you right now right so your brain just and, just goes into idle yeah and so patrick does it my son patrick does it all the time like that's his way yeah. Uh, if he wants to talk to anybody, uh, whether they work for us or we're considering that they're going to work for us or we're considering an investment in, in their company, like that's, that's the way to do it. And, and it's, what's really interesting is that it also naturally relaxes most people. Right. And, and I don't know whether you watch succession on HBO. Um, I'm not okay. familiar with it, but, but I've never seen it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so. Uh, one of the things is the the father is kind of old and he's had some health problems. And so he goes with with a guy who's like, let's take a walk. And of course, it was the worst thing because he like was dying near the end. <laughs> but but the point is, is that it's like because it it underlines what I think is nat comes naturally to you, which is you've got to assess the situation on the ground when you get there, right? Yeah, so, totally. So it's like, it's like the, the, more, the more prep you do, the worse you're going to do. I Precisely. Think I think that's probably true for job interviews. That might be terrible advice. Like maybe, maybe you should prep, but I think it's going to come off better when it's just an actual conversation. Um, yes. there's, there's this funny quote that I like from this Twitter meme account called Goldman Sachs Elevator. And he says, just be yourself is good advice for maybe 10% of people. Uh, <laughs> but I think, I think it's actually, I think it's actually uh, as funny as it is, I think it's actually true. Like whenever I do a thing where it's like a fireside chat event, where it's like, hey, let's come have a conversation. A lot of groups will be like, hey, I want to prep out every question. And I want, and I want to, and I'm like, no, 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 I don't want, I don't want, I wanted to show up and have a chat and have it come off as a chat. That's when you're going to get the best the, the best conversations versus a forced structured, like I've prepped every question and we're just reading from a transcript at that point. Like it's the, that, that never leads to a good conversation. It's totally a waste of time. In my opinion, I've had a few times in my life where people tried to script me and it was horrible. It doesn't Absolutely. work. It, doesn't it work. just yeah. doesn't work. And I got, I, I was awful. I, you know, and it was just like, and I'm like, I realized that you know, because I was thinking, wow, I was so bad. And I realized, oh, well, because I was scripted. Yes. Y if you want, th that's what my goal with this podcast was. It was like my dinner with Andre. What I'm going to do is have fascinating, smart people on and talk to them. <laughs> I, I, I might be wrong about this. I'm only like 80% confident this, this story is true, but I'm pretty sure Pat, the origin of Patrick's podcast was he had lunch with Jeff Graham. And at the end of the lunch, he said, I wish we could have recorded this. And that's it where is. it came from. Is that, yeah. is that true? I, I, yes. I, I, I think I, I'm pretty sure that's true. Yeah. And it's true. Like a lot of people, when you're having a private lunch, you're like, this was such a great conversation. And of course that private lunch is not scripted. It's not, right. it's, you're just talking, you're just talking to each other. Exactly. I think recreating, recreating that magic anywhere you can is important. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, okay. So the, 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 the last question I want to ask uh, about um, this uh, about your book and and ties in with your with your the book you're writing is have have you in a clutch have you ever panicked and like I've I've told this story before and this was pretty recent this was two years ago which is that um, my wife and I had a long standing plan to sell our house in Virginia in May of 2020 we made that well before the pandemic it was like okay May is when we're gonna have a house we got a realtor and like okay we're gonna we're gonna list this house in May. 
in March of 2020, as the world is collapsing, and we were really staring at Great Depression 2.0, I woke up one night and I was like, there might not be a market to sell in May. The market might not exist. I remember talking to one of my really smart macro friends, and he said, hey, non-bank lenders, which make 60% of mortgages, they're all going out of business in the next month because all the mortgage payments were stalled or were uh, you know, uh, paused, and the non-bank lenders were not getting any help from the treasury. They're, they're gone. And he was like, when that happens, that's 60% of mortgages, the whole real estate market stops. So I woke up one night and I was like, we not, might not be able to sell our house in May. And I called my our realtor the next day. This was in March of 2020. And I said, I want to list our house tomorrow. Just, just put it on the market today and you, you can cut the price. So I, just, I, I want it sold today. And he goes, Morgan, don't panic. And I said, oh, I'm panicked. You are looking panic <laughs> in the face right now. This is what panic <laughs> looks like. And look, the house sold for more than we listed it for. Like it was no problem. And it turned out. And I don't regret that in the slightest. I think that was the right thing to do. But yeah. the takeaway for me, and I knew this before, but it's once you experience it, it feels different. It's like, you never know how it's going to feel in the moment. Because look, what, what went through my head when I woke up at two in the morning thinking about this was, if we don't sell our house in Virginia, it's going to be really hard to buy our house in Seattle where we live now. We've already under contract for that. Okay, if we don't sell our house, I'm going to have to sell these stocks at a 50% discount. I was like running through all these scenarios and it was like, fuck, this is not good. Yeah. And there are times when it's like, so I, I actually don't think it was, it was panic, but it was just... All of a sudden, I was like, okay, I thought I was going to do X, but I need to immediately do Y to make sure that I'm taking care of my family. So I don't regret yeah. it. And it all right. worked out. But that was as close as it's come to be like, oh, I didn't think I was going to have this emotion, but oh, it's here. Yeah. So um, uh, I think that um, that brings us back to sort of Jason's idea. You can show lots of pictures of snakes, but it's not until you throw the real live snake in their lap that you're going to see how people are going to do. And, and so one of the things that um, I, I have through my long career found, and that is I have come to understand the fragility of your average human being and, right. and acknowledge that I'm a human and we're all humans. And if you, if you just give people a little more room, give them a little more ability to breathe, right? Um, you're probably making a better decision than if you're like, uh, you can't do that. You must do this. It's like your whole idea. It's like, I hate that. There, yeah. People say, you know, Jim, give me your, give me your five reasons or five best investment ideas. And I'm like, no, I can't do that. It's yeah. like, they'll be, they'll be different. Like, four months from now. Totally. And, and, and that's why I get like triggered by these 10 things entrepreneurs do in the morning. Bullshit. It's all just a lie. And, and what bothers me- You is know it's that, a lie because none of them include going to, bed, going to the bathroom in the morning. So then you know it's exactly, all bullshit from the get-go. Right, exactly, right? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Well, do you want to really know what I do? When you want to really know? <laughs> it's not pleasant. <laughs> Well, Morgan, this has been fantastic. I can't, when, when is the new book coming out? Are you working on it right now? I'm working on it right now. I would say that there is a very good chance that it's for sale one year from now. That's what cool. I, I, I put like, I put 75% confidence and it's for sale one year from now. Yeah. So I had Tim Urban on who I love and like, he's the biggest procrastinator in the world. Um, oh yeah. And, and <laughs> Hey, Tim, uh, uh, when's the book coming out? Don't ask me about the book. Well, here, here's, here's what publishers do that sets this up for someone like me and Tim is when you sign a contract with the publisher, they're like, great, we need the manuscript in two years. And then I'm like, great. So I'll start working on it in one year and 11 months. <laughs> That's when I'll start thinking about this thing. I, <laughs> so, I, learned... so I, need, I need tight deadlines. And if you give me a long leash, I'm going to eat it up. <laughs> yep, same with me. And I learned that with the only really kind of commercial book I did called how to retire rich and they gave me a big advance for it and like I was like oh I was all like oh I got this big advance and then I was like holy shit I've now I've got to produce you write and a book like, now. Yeah. yeah you got to write a book and so in in that particular instance I was it was like it was nerve-wracking so yeah. I, I I definitely think that being able to um to have that amount of time is great. Um, so my final question uh, is, 
uh, is different than Patrick's. Patrick uh, is always about the kindest thing that anyone has ever done for you. And when what's I was the on worst thing ever, what, what, what's the shittiest thing you've ever done? What's the shittiest thing? You should start asking that question. <laughs> <laughs> you get some good answers out of that. Who do you, who do you want to name and shame? Uh, <laughs> but but what, so the one that I like is that we're going to wave a wand. We're going to make you the emperor of the world for one day. You can't kill anyone. You can't incarcerate oh, well, anyone. Yeah, I know. In that case. I know. That's why I always put those two provisos in there, but you can accept them. You can have a little magic microphone that you speak into and everyone wakes up the next morning, but they think it's their idea. They don't yeah. think you, they don't think it came from you. They just, I just had this great idea to what two things are you going to accept in the world? I would, um, cause this is the magic wand. I'll make this ridiculous. I would show people exactly in their life when the things that they admired about themselves were actually due to luck. And I would like, I would like, I would show everyone a movie of like, Hey, this point in, in your life, in your life that you think you did this actually, here's what happened behind the scenes. You didn't know about that actually led to that thing. I think that would instill a degree of humility in people that would be so beneficial. It would help. It, it would not depress them. It'd be so beneficial to know. And also I would, since this is a magic wand, I would show them everyone else in the world's movie too. I'd be like, here's all the areas where Jim got lucky and Morgan got lucky. And then they would, they would stop idolizing people for just some level of success. And they would look at individual actions that led to what, what actually like they did on their own, on their own volition to actually get to where they were. Because I think one right. of the biggest problems in the world, not one of the biggest problems, that's, that's, that's exaggerating, but a problem in the world is that we underestimate the role of luck in a massive, massive way. And even there's that saying of like, oh, the harder I work, the luckier I get. I think, I think that's bullshit too. I think luck is just luck. And I think if you, if, you are, or if you are working hard to become luckier, then that's actually a skill. Like luck is right. just luck. Like for you and I, you and I are white American males born in the latter half of the, of the 20th century. That's just luck. You and I did nothing to do that. It's just what happened. And I think all everyone has some story like that that they underappreciate, and to make them aware of it would be a huge help in the world. Yeah, uh, the the exercise that works really well there is Rawls' Veil of Ignorance, um, where you ask people, uh, "You're going to design society, but here's what you don't know: you don't know if you're going to be a boy or a girl. You don't know whether you're going to be rich or poor. You don't know whether you're going to be dumb or smart. You don't know whether you're going to have a handicap." You don't know any of this. And wow, do people change the way they design a society with yeah. that? Because like, yeah, I, I in fact, I, I, wrote a, I wrote a thread about luck because of something you had up. And the first thing I was like, I'm the first person to admit that like I was born sliding into home plate. <laughs> and, you know, those are things I didn't control, right? But I also totally agree with your last statement, which is, if you keep an eye out and learn the skill of trying to see a lucky situation and then taking advantage of it, you're right. That is a skill. And I've been on both sides of that. I've been on, on taking advantage, but I've been on not taking advantage. And boy, that one smarts. Yeah, because... no, there, there, are, there are a lot of people who say the harder I work, the luckier I get. And I think that's just a false humility. Like if, if you actually did take an action, that's skill. Luck is just luck for ev for everyone. It's just yeah. like you're 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 uh, you're you're changing the definition of luck if you think you can do something to improve the odds of getting it. What's interesting is that you know I I, I tell a joke that like half the people I tell it to get literally angry. Yes. And totally. and, and 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 the joke is this: there's a guy who's been given fifty folders on applicants for a job, and he's just like pissed off about it. His assistant brings them in and he says to his assistant, hey, pick 25 at random and throw them away. And the assistant looks at him and he goes, why would you do that? He goes, I don't like unlucky people. <laughs> See, that's, that's good. That's like, I'm, 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 I'm pissed off now as well, but that's a good story. There you go. I know. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Okay. So number two, you're going to show people their luck. What do you got for number two? I would make people aware of what it's like to live in the bottom 1% of society around the world. And I think it's, I think that's something that 
everyone, everyone who's probably listening to this is, is in the fortunate layer of society. And I think there's no amount of empathy that I can have, you can have anyone that can truly comprehend what's how some people live in this world. And to make you aware of what it is like would probably be a degree, would increase empathy exponentially if you could actually feel what it's like to live in destitute poverty that so many people in the world do. That'd that'd be the second thing I would do. So I I would instill humility and empathy by those two things. That, that those are, are two great ones. And the thing that I would add to the second one is that's why I'm such a strong proponent of traveling as much as you can. Yeah. So uh, like Africa, I saw uh, bone crushing poverty when I was in Nairobi and we were like near the slum. It was just like, holy shit. And that wasn't even me experiencing it. That was yeah. just me seeing it. And, and I think that one of the reasons why I believe so much in travel is it takes you out of yourself and reminds you that there are all sorts of different people in the world. There's all sorts of different cultures. There's all sorts of different things. And you should know a little bit about that because it's going to make you more tolerant. It's going to make you understand how, you know, like one of the things that I do, like when I take a hot shower, I have been doing this for like five years. Whenever I take a hot shower, I say thank you, because not only did I see how many people in Africa didn't have that luxury, but then you think about history, man. It's like, what do you do? We realize how fucking lucky we are to be alive right now. I mean, 150 years ago, a cut on my hand could kill me. Yes. You know, and 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 so like. The, the shower thing happened when when we were actually in Africa and we were in the bush and there was no hot showers. And like when I got back to the, the camp and there was, I was just like shouting to my wife, I have never, ever understood how much I should be rejoicing that I get to take a hot shower. Totally. totally. So, my, my wife had a similar experience. She did a medical mission in, in Nicaragua a decade ago. And for seven days, she ate nothing but rice and beans, like cold rice and beans for seven days. And she came home and she was like, I will never view food the same way ever again for the rest of my life. Yeah. And, and, and to be aware of that and to notice that I just think makes you a better person because it, 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 it opens your eyes to a, are you kidding me? Stop complaining (laughs) and, and, and stop with all of your bitching and moaning and look at the fact that like. I won the cosmic lottery, man. And yeah. I thank God for that every day. Well, listen, Morgan, this has been amazingly fun. Um, I can't wait to read your new book. Um, and um, keep on keeping on, man. I I, I, yeah. I, I admire you. And uh, I love the fact that um, you are kind of becoming a, the voice of your generation, which is awesome because... Um, you know, uh, it, it, your messages are resonate with me. I mean, it's funny because we do things completely differently, right? I'm a cause, yes. an active manager, um, all of those things. But if you if you remove all that, we really have the same message, right? Which is have a rule based plan. Don't get emotional. You know, yes. this is it's this actually is how very you do similar. It. Yeah, what what and, you and I do. I think there's yeah. a lot of that in finance where you think it's different, but it's actually like we're actually going on the same principles. We're just doing it a little bit differently. Yeah, yeah. And so, look forward to seeing you when you're next in New York uh, and Seattle. Loving it. Oh yeah, Seattle's great. My 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 wife grew up here. She and I lived here for a couple of years after college, so it's nothing new to us, and right. we love it here. This is where her family is. Um, and yes, yeah, yeah, Seattle's great. We it's it's great here. We love it. Perfect. Well, thank you for coming on, my friend. And I look forward to seeing you when you're next in New York. Thanks, Jim. Take care. This has been fun.